morning, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Stand as we lift up praise to our God, our King. Join me as we raise a hallelujah.
good. Amen? He is. What a blessing. What a joy to lift up our praises. I pray that as we sing, you would focus your mind's attention and your heart's affection on the Creator, the God, our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in His name that we have been redeemed. Amen? Sing 
Some of you may not feel like singing praise right now. The world is heavy. Circumstances can be really heavy. I get it. But that's why we're here. We gather here to remind one another of the truth that Jesus is king. His love is incredible. His grace is unending. He is here. Surrender your will, your mind. And right now, I am yours. Father, I am yours. Do in me what I cannot.
about hopelessness, would you turn it around this morning? Addiction, would you turn it around this morning, God? Fear, would you turn it around, God? We are hopeful, we are free, we are courageous people for you. Would you pray with me? Would you pray with me? If you are here this morning and there is an area in your life where you need God to turn it around, there is an addiction. There is an unmet expectation in your life you've been praying for for months or maybe years. There's a broken relationship. There's a diagnosis. Right now, I just want to ask in this room, would you, would you lift that up to God? Would you speak it up to God right now? Just tell him what it is. Say, Lord, would you turn this around? Just tell him right now, wherever you're at in this room, if there's something specific you're praying for, just tell him. Just tell him what that is. Father, we come to you this morning and these songs that we sing, we worship you, Father. We know you, we love you, we thank you for Jesus. These songs that we sing are also prayers from our heart. Lord, we need you to move in our lives. Lord, we cannot do it on our own. We stop and, and as we sing these songs, that's what we recognize, Lord. On our own, it is not possible. With you, Father, all things are possible. You are king, you are all powerful, and you are heavenly, Father, you are all loving. And so in the name of Jesus, we lift these prayers up to you. And Lord, we can do this because we've know, we know you've moved before. Lord, earlier this morning, I'm in that lobby and I hear people coming up to me telling me about prayers they prayed last night that you answered overnight, Lord. That's the kind of God you are. You can turn it around, Father. We say thank you for being a miracle worker. We say thank you for healing our bodies and healing our hearts, healing that man's calf. Where he went to bed, he didn't think he was going to come to church today, and he was here. He was bouncing like Tigger. He was running around so excited to be here, Lord. We say thank you for that. I say thank you for the students over here that lift up the name of Jesus. They're in love with you, Jesus. I say thank you for the students that surrendered their lives to you this weekend, Lord. We say thank you for that, Father. You've done it before. We pray that you would do it again. We lift these prayers up to you, believing you hear us. You are worthy of our praise, Father. We trust you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. Hey, here's what I want you to do. Before you find a seat, you need to, like, give somebody at least two high fives this morning. So find two people. Give them a high five. Say, hey, I'm glad you are here today. Praise the Lord. And then you can grab a seat when you're done with that. Well, good morning, and welcome to Church of the City. My name is Derek, and I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad you are all here. I'm especially glad the high school students over here in the corner are here. Are you guys excited to have them here? We're glad. Half of you are still awake, so that's great, right? They were up all night last night. I'm guessing average bedtime was like 3 a.m. I mean, if your parents in the room, it was like you were, you were in bed by 10 p.m., though, right? Yeah, 9, 9.30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good, Kyle. Um... Uh, we're glad you're here, and welcome to Church of the City. If you're a guest with us, uh, we are especially glad you're here, and we want you to know that this is a place where you can belong and be a part of what God is up to uh, in this room, in this place, not just on Sunday mornings. That's just like a sliver of the week, but throughout the week, what God's up to. You know, and that you know, God's up to something. Tuesday nights, 
God's up to something. Wednesday night, city students, you guys can feel it, can't you? God's up to something in city students and what, what's going on, especially with the high schoolers and middle schoolers. And so we just want to invite you into that. One very simple way, there, is a, there should be a card in the seat in front of you. It says share with us. Just fill that out. And uh, Jen Smith and her team will be at the Next Steps booth after the service. They would love to say hi to you and, um, and connect with you before you leave here today. All right. I'd like to invite the worship host forward at this time as we prepare to receive the offering. Um, as they make their way forward, I, I thought about a story that took place this week. Did you guys know a bunch of kids went around to different homes and got candy for free this past week? It's an amazing, it's the one time of the year where you can put a sign out front and say, hey, come to my house, get free candy. You know, it's just awesome, isn't it? And uh, so they did. And in the process, what was so cool is we, uh, we got to, uh, I got to steal a bunch of my kids' candy, which was great. Don't tell my kids. Uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups is where it's at. Um, and uh, the, you know what's so great is the Halloween one is the best because you get more peanut butter inside. We, we can be done talking about that. But um, there was this kid that, uh, man, he became famous overnight. His name is Jackson Champagne. Have you heard of that name before? It's a pretty impressive name, isn't it? Jackson Champagne. He lives in Maryland. And he's an eight-year-old kid who uh, became uh, kind of like an internet sensation overnight because he went up to a house that had one of those ring doorbell cameras, which catch everything. So just a heads up on that, you know, things can get pretty intense real quick. Um, he went up to a house that uh, the bowl must have had a sign out front. The family wasn't home, and the sign must have said something like, hey, grab one piece of candy and then keep going. But we all know what that sign means, right? That means grab at least two or three for each member of your family. And it was empty, and so Jackson, he knew there was other kids coming up to this house still, and he thought, well, that ain't right. So he actually took his bag of candy. You know what he did? He filled that bucket with his own candy. He said, all the kids, they need some candy. And the person who had the ring doorbell found that and posted it, and I think it's had like 15 million views. You can Google Jackson Champagne. But that kid gets it, doesn't he? You know, Jesus said some words years ago that that kid understood. In Acts 20, verse 35, we hear these words from Jesus. He said this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that true? Jackson's not going to remember the candy he gave away. He's not going to remember that, but he is going to remember that moment where he was able to give to others. And that, that is a moment he won't forget, and I guarantee you his parents won't forget either. And God won't forget that dude's heart. Amen. And so right now we have an opportunity not to give candy into the offering. Please don't do that right now. I mean, if you do, I just promise you I'm going to eat that candy, so go ahead. You can do that. I should say I'd give it to the well, which is outside, but I might sneak at least one Reese's on the way there. Um, but this is an opportunity to give back. And just, just so you understand this, this is, not, this is not so that we earn God's love. Jackson didn't do that to earn his neighbor's love or those other kids' love or his mom's love when he did that. In the same way, we don't do this to earn God's love. This is a response to God's love for us and his generosity to us. Amen? Amen. So let's, uh, let's take a moment and let's pray over this offering. Father, thank you for always providing. Thank you for the fact that we have, uh, we have provision. We have, we have food. And if we don't have food, we have amazing ministries like the Well Outreach that will get us food when we need it so that our bellies can be filled. We, we say thank you because we know that all comes from you. And in this moment, even this food that, um, or even this, this offering that we're about to give, Lord, we recognize that what we have, it comes from you. That our gifts and our abilities that allow us to have jobs, to make money, Lord, we recognize that that comes from you. And in this moment, we give back to you as an offering, trusting you in this area of our life. Lord, you are worthy of our worship with our word and with singing, and you are worthy of our worship with our resources. And so we give back to you, and we ask that you would use this offering to extend your kingdom in our hearts, reminding us that it is blessed it is more blessed to give than to receive. And Lord, that you would use this offering to extend your kingdom in Spring Hill and beyond. We love you, Father. We thank you for your provision. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
All right. Well, as the worship hosts receive the offering, a few things for you to be aware of going on in the life of our church. Uh, if you don't know, today, at, I think at this service, um, we just had the culmination of a high school city students retreat called The Weekend. And that is why we have a bunch of students over here. Did you guys have a good time? Love it. I did see some yawns earlier. You guys probably are a little tired. Parents, you're going to get a gift of like a four-hour nap this afternoon, okay? That would be great. But, you know, I had a, the privilege of hanging out with them last night and singing that song earlier. Like, that is exactly what's going on. He is up to something. God is up to something in the lives of our students. They aren't the next generation. They are the now generation. God is using them not just to change their lives and their families, but their schools and their friends. They care deeply about the kingdom of God breaking into their community. My favorite moment, students, uh, was, was yesterday, just watching that board. You know that board that I'm talking about where you wrote down on there? Maybe some things that were lies. Maybe some lies that you've let creep into your head that just aren't true about who you are. And my favorite thing is that the team the staff had other students go around and tell those people that had written those things down what is true about them, that God is for you, not against you, that he is on your side, that he is a, he is a gracious God. I love that it was you that spoke truth to your friends. That was a gift for me to see, and I just love that, that you pressed into that and that God's up to, bless you, and that God's up to something uh, in your ministry. Keep doing that. And I'm excited for uh, all the stories that you're going to share, hopefully, with your parents and your family. Um, but I'm grateful for this experience that you've had this weekend. May it not stay here in this building. May it continue on from here. But I'm also excited because it reminds me of how important it is to get away for a weekend and ask the Lord to move in our lives because mark your calendars. We have a little thing called winter retreat happening in end of January and February. So if you are a parent of a middle schooler or high schooler, or, or how about this, you guys could actually help raise the funds for this trip as well. Can you guys do that? You're not cheering as loud for that one. <laughs> you guys can figure out a way to be there because the Lord does something when we get away for a weekend. So hopefully you guys can do that and uh, be a part of a middle school or high school retreat. This thing will fill up, so parents, mark the dates. And if you get in the super, I guess it's called the super early bird rate, that would be awesome. All right. So winter retreat is happening. Second thing for you to know about, I don't know if you guys realize this, but November is National Adoption Awareness Month. And so, yes, I'm excited about this. As a church, next Sunday, we are going to celebrate this with a Sunday called Belong Sunday. Belong Sunday. Now, we know not every family, not every individual is called to foster or adopt, but every family, every individual in this room, if you're a follower of the way of Jesus, you are called to care. We are called to care and come around, come alongside families that have fostered, are fostering, or have adopted. And so next Sunday, we're going to talk about how we do that as a church, how to see the kingdom of God break in to our community. Did you know there are over 125,000 children in the United States in the foster care system? We need to do something about that. We need to be a part of the solution. The church should be on the cutting edge of doing that. And so next Sunday, we're going to talk about what that looks like as a church. I'm really excited. You know, many of you know, we have a thing called the wraparound closet. And the Lord has been using that in so many uh, families' lives. And we're going to talk more about what God's up to this next year. So I encourage you to be here uh, next Sunday uh, to talk about that together as a church. Uh, last thing for you to be aware of. Many of you know that we love to do uh, the daddy-daughter dates and dances at our church, and a lot of schools do this as well. There's not enough mother-son events, is there, uh, in our community. And so one of the things we're going to do, not this Friday, but next Friday, we're going to have a mother-son date night. So mom's in the room. Make sure you mark your calendars for November 15th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, now, here's, here's what I'm so excited about. Um, we are going to be having, at some level, a Nerf war take place that night. So I actually called my mom up. She's going to be in town, and I'm coming, and I'm going to dominate at this thing. I'm so excited. Um, now, I encourage you guys, moms, to, to sign up for this thing. It'll be fun. It'll be kindergarten through fifth grade, but moms, use your discretion, okay? If 
There's somebody a little on the, on the older side. Uh, that would be great. If you're 17 years old, that might be a little old, but um, we trust you, moms, to make the decision on that one. And make sure you sign up for it. It'll be a fun night. All right. Right now, we are going to continue in our series. We're looking at the book of Acts, a series called People of the Way. If you're a guest, welcome into this series. And I'm excited because we have one of our own family members here uh, to share the message, to preach this morning to us. The one, the only, Mr. Danny Williamson is here. Did you get a haircut? You're looking good, dude. You're looking good. Uh, you know, and I say this. Every, almost every time somebody um, comes on this stage, but we want to remind you that this place does not revolve around one person. We love to see everyone exercise their gifts and what the Lord's doing in their life. And so I'm excited to have you hear from, from Danny Williamson and what the Lord's placed on his heart. Uh, but before he shares, would you please stand in the honor of the reading of God's word? We're in Acts chapter 10 this morning, Acts chapter 10, this is, verses, this is verses 34 through 44 from the New King James Version. The scripture says this, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through, through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witnessed that. Through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And while Peter st was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And please give a kind welcome to Danny Williamson as he makes his way to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something. It would be really awesome if everybody could change seats. I'm just kidding, come on. <laughs> but there was a bit of like, uh, discomfort. We're gonna talk about change today. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the work of your Holy Spirit transforming us into the image of your Son. Lord, would you continue that work today in our midst? I pray that your word would go forth in power I do ask that you'd take me out of the way and that you would speak clearly to the hearts and minds and lives of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Change, change. We all kind of felt that like, eh, I don't know about all that stuff. Now, I've been through a few changes in my time. I, I, one distinct change in my life was when I joined the United States Navy I was 18 years old, and I remember getting off that bus, and I had a Walkman in my hand and, and these orange, like, headphone things, you know, and, and they, they immediately get on the bus. I'm in the back, and I'm like, oh, no. And they're like, get off, get off, get off. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I'd already shaved my head. I beat him to the punch, so I'm like, okay, I'm ready. But I knew at that moment things are going to change. You know, no more sitting at home with the remote in hand. It was like, yes, sir, yes, sir, because my drill instructor had tattoos all the way up his neck, like wrapped around his ears. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a long couple months. <laughs> this is rough. So that was a massive change in my life. It took some adjusting. And then there was the change of marriage. Oh, yeah. And I remember going, we went to Costa Rica on our honeymoon, and someone even gave us a little heads up like, hey, don't be surprised, you might get in an argument on your honeymoon, but it's okay if that happens. Well, 
we did. And I remember thinking, wow, this is a lot of change. I'm not used to this, you know. And, and then waking up and seeing a human being right next to me it was a massive change. Then there was the change of children that entered our life. Can I get an amen? <laughs> when kids show up, I remember people always tell you, you know, when, when you're pregnant as a couple, and or when my wife was pregnant, you know, <laughs> I'm supporting, and, and they always say, hey, everything's going to change. And you're like, yeah, right. Amen, amen. Well, <laughs> everything changed. I remember we brought our oldest boy, Isaac, home and, and put him in the little bassinet thing and rocker. And, and then we're looking at him and we're like, well, now what do we do? And, and then that night, for some odd reason, we thought we could go back to our normal lives and the baby would just be sleeping wonderfully. And we're like, yeah, let's start to watch a movie. And, yeah, right. <laughs> it's changed our world. And then I think of the change of moving. We've moved quite a few times in our life. And I remember the big change we had when we moved down to Argentina. We had our two oldest boys with us. And uh, we were down there. I, I'll never forget. We had flown down, got on this long bus ride, get off on the bus. And we're standing there on the street. And we had 16 luggages with us. Because we moved our entire life. And there we had two little toddlers looking at us like, what are we doing? And I'm like, I don't know. No hablo espanol. You know, it was a massive change. It took some getting used to. So this idea of change, really, I think it can mess us up a little bit. It really has a tendency to mess us up sometimes. But some of us, it brings, when we hear of change, like moving your seat at church, it's like, oh, no, there's anxiety and fear and those things. And others, though, we hear change, we're like, yeah, let's go for it. It brings joy and peace and hope and those things. But still, so many questions begin to arise as we think about this idea of change, of what if, or so many questions of why or how is this all going to work out. But one thing I have learned is that change is good. You see, if we don't change, we don't grow. Amen. The early church, the people of the way, they were about to experience a radical, revolutionary change, as we're going to see here in the book of Acts. You see, God was at work. He was up to something. He was about to turn something so beautifully good into something so beautifully great. He was moving glory to glory. You see, here's the thing. God does not change. His character is not altered. He, is, he does not change. He is an immovable rock. But, but, he is always changing us to make us more like him. So, uh, as Philippians 3.21 says, He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So up to this point, the early church, the people of the way, they were predominantly believing Jews. They had found their groove. They found their rhythm. They, they, they had found their Messiah. They were filled with boldness in the synagogues. They were reaching out to their brothers, and people were being saved. Miracles and healings are happening on a continual basis. The community was thriving, and they were beginning to truly walk under the canopy of God's amazing grace. God's grace was radically being poured out upon his people. But this same grace was about to change everything. You see, the believing Jews of the early church, they were eager for Jesus to return. Maranatha, they're longing for him to return and, and set up his, his everlasting kingdom. But somehow, the millions of Gentiles throughout the world had escaped their thoughts, their mission, and their vision. God's mission for mankind was greater, far wider, far deeper than they could ever have possibly imagined. And it was his amazing grace that, would, that was going to bring about this change. 
Now, how is this applicable to us? We see the early church. They're about ready to have this massive change, and, and, and they're, they're diving in, and they're, and they're, they're serving Jesus passionately, and, and great things are happening, but yet there's these millions of Gentiles that have yet to hear about the saving grace of Jesus. So I ask for us believers here in this wonderful place we call Middle Tennessee. You know, God is up to something radical in our midst. People are being saved. We're hearing continually of people being healed. This morning, we're hearing of that. Lives are being transformed. Communities are truly thriving. And we are under this beautiful canopy of God's grace. But this same grace can change everything to a greater extent. You see, we are ready for Jesus to return. We're saying, come quickly, Lord. Reign over us. But I need to ask, have the millions of souls without Jesus throughout the world of different cultures and different cities and different countries escaped our thoughts, our mission, and our vision? You see, there's an entire world out there of yet to hear about Jesus. I remember living in Morocco in 2006, and here's the thing about Morocco is it's 99.6% Muslim. And I remember walking through these cities in Morocco, and, and I'll never forget these moments because I'm literally looking at thousands upon thousands of people. And according to these numbers, if they are correct, which they are, I'm looking at this vast majority of people. Everybody I'm looking at has no idea who Jesus is is. They have no idea of the beauty of his salvation. I remember just being awestruck by, by this and, and moved in my gut like something has to be done. Now I want to pose this simple challenge to just get us thinking. I'm not pointing the finger. I'm not laying down the hammer or any of those things. I just want to get us thinking about these things. Andrew Scott, the president of Operation Mobilization USA, he said this, we spend more money every year on Halloween costumes for our pets than we do on reaching the least of these. We have to take a step back and say, what is happening in our world today? And what should we do as a result? We need to rethink our models and we need to rethink our message. While God is undeniably doing amazing things all around the world, there are still 2.8 billion unreached people today. In fact, close to 90% of Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists will never meet another Christian or see the beautiful, glorious gospel lived out in front of them. This really unsettles me. Something has to change. Maybe some things need to change right here in our midst. Let's, let's do celebrate all that God is doing. Let's continue to pray for him to do more and more, but let it go beyond just Williamson County and Maury County. Let it, let it go beyond Spring Hill. Let it go to the ends of the earth. Maybe we do need to expand our cultural horizons and get some additional cultural training on how to reach Muslims or how to reach Hindus. I mean, we live in an area where it's the, the largest Kurdish population in America. That means there's a lot of people with an Islamic background that need to hear about Jesus. Are we prepared to share with them? So this very cultural dilemma leads us here to the book of Acts in chapter 10. God awakening his church with his desire to reach all people, Jew and Gentile, with his salvation. And three points we're going to see is God's pursuit, God's plan, and God's power. So a little recap of what had been happening up to this point. Chapters 1 through 3 in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Pentecost, and the early church was born. Chapters 4 through 9, persecution began to arise in the church. Growth continues. Signs and wonders are happening. We saw last week the radical conversion of the Apostle Paul, showing that God can save anybody. Amen. Can I give a shout out for Kanye West? Seriously, the least we can do is pray for him. Let's just pray for him. We don't have to point the finger and like, I don't know. I don't know if it's real. Well, think about your own, converse, your, your own conversion. Aren't you glad people prayed for you and you're still here? 
So let's do the same for him. Let's just do it. We don't have to criticize. Let's just pray for our new brother in Jesus. God can save anybody. And the door of saving grace has now, as we see here in Acts, that it's been opened wide to the Gentiles. And it starts with this first point of God's pursuit, which is changing our religion into relationship. Let me read verse 1 through 8 to chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And so when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So we see this man, Cornelius. He was a centurion. He was a leader of over uh, about 80 to 100 Roman soldiers. He was a devout man. He was committed He was dedicated. He was one who feared God along with his entire household. He was a giving man. He gave alms generously to the people and to the poor. He sought after God. It says he prayed to God always. You see, he was a good man. He was a very religious man, but it simply was not enough. God realized it, and Cornelius realized it. There's something more. Something's got to change. I think of a friend of mine who was led to Christ by the Dalai Lama. Let me explain. You're like, what? He grew up in India. He went to a private school, and while he was at his private school in high school, and he, and he was raised in a Christian home, but then during high school, he started to drift a little bit, and he started to want to dabble with other religions and see what was out there and those things. He wasn't sure if Christianity was for him, so he began to search far and wide. And during his high school years, they had a field trip, and they had the opportunity to go meet the Dalai Lama. And he's like, man, this is it. I'm gonna get the true path of enlightenment. And he he finally meets him face to face and however he addressed him, whether it was Mr. Dalai or Mr. Lama or both, I don't know. But he was like, excuse me, what do I need to do to be on this path of enlightenment that I I can truly find the way? And the Dalai Lama responded to him and he says, get more religion. And he was like, That's weird. Walked away and he was like, no way, no way. And he just began to see the the futility of man's attempt to try to reach God through religion. And and he finally just began to open up the scriptures again. And he he, just a couple months later, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Come on now, come on. Now he's he's a church planner in India and it's an amazing testimony. But the Dalai Lama led him to the Lord. I love it because he helped him see the futility of religion. You see, God's not after our religion. He's after the relationship of our hearts. God knows that our religious attempts just won't cut it. Our own righteousness, the best things we can do is like filthy rags compared to his holiness. No matter how good we are, we still need a savior because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There must be a change from religion to relationship. And maybe we have grown up in the South and and we've known this Christian culture and those kinds of things, but God's calling us to relationship. It's not just a Christian culture we're part of. It's, It's a true transformation of heart and life where Jesus really becomes our best friend, our Lord, our everything. You see, God is in pursuit of the heart of man. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and what is, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they chose sin over God. What did God do? He was, he was just shouting from a broken heart or speaking from a broken heart and saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And ever since, God has been radically pursuing mankind. Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. 
And here he sees this man, Cornelius. The eyes of God are, are roaming throughout the earth, and he, and he sees this man, Cornelius. And he sees the heart of this Roman leader longing to know him. And the heart of God pursues this Gentile soldier. And now we will see that the plans of God change all of history in the process. The second major point is God's plan, changing our fears into faith. Now, I really think in the fiber of our being, we are perplexed and immensely curious about the plans of God. We want to know, God, what are your plans for my life? What are your plans for me today? Why are you leading me in this direction? Why are you doing this? How is this all going to work? We want to know his plans. Think about it. One of the most popular verses that we use and we're comforted by Jeremiah 29, 11. Go to a Hallmark store. You're going to find it on a few cards. It's going to be there. We love this verse because we want to know the plans of God. As it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You know what the number one song on the Billboard Top 100 was last year? God's plan. God's plan. Right? It was. Because we're curious about God's plan. We want to know, what is your plan, God? I want, let, let us desire and walk in it. So it's a good thing. But God, so God has a plan. And we do want to know his plans. But I think that we are so often fearful about what those plans actually are. Because it's going to involve change. Just as we see here in verses 9 through 43. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But, but God is about to rock Peter's world. He's about to shake up his fears. He's about to renew his faith. And God is about to ask Peter to step into something way outside of his comfort zone. And it starts with this vision that God gives to initiate his plan. Peter's vision, it, it really, as you see there in verses 9 through 16, if you were to read it, you'd see that it, would, it started with prayer. Okay, while Peter was waiting for his lunch, he went up on the rooftop, this flat rooftop, and he's sitting up there, and he just starts to pray. Here's the thing. When we pray, things happen. Things change. Our, our vision changes. Our mission in life changes when we're, really, when we're willing to come under the subjection of the whole, to the Holy Spirit and say, God, what are you doing? And just we start to call upon his name. Things begin to happen. So it started with prayer, and then things begin to happen, and he has this vision that would change history. Heaven is open, this great sheet. It's being held out by its four corners. And all kinds of four-footed animals come. They're on it and they're creepy. And, and, and then the Lord says to him, he gives some instruction. He's like, Peter, rise up and eat. And Peter is like, no way. That's disgusting. Right? And he, here's the thing. In, in Israel, and in Jewish custom, food is a big deal. Eating kosher is a big deal. For those of you who are going to be going to Israel in 2021, get, just prepare yourselves. Food is a big deal. You're not going to be able to get no pepperoni pizza, none of that, like anti-kosher stuff. So kosher is a big deal. Eating kosher was vitally important to Peter. And so the Lord's telling him to do this, and he's just like, I don't know. And, and it reminds me of one of my buddies when he was living in Israel, and, and he's a great friend of mine. He's not Jewish, but he loves to wear the, the Jewish tassels. It's like part fashion, part like connecting with the Lord. I don't know, but he likes to wear these tassels, no teeth seat or anything like that on his head, but he, he walks around with them, and he's, there he is in Israel, and he goes in this place called Meat Burger, which is like so unkosher. It's like bacon galore, you know, half, like medium rare, like all that stuff. And he walks in with these tassels, and they look at him, they're like, no, get out of here, it's not kosher. And he's like, it's cool, there's grace. It was awesome. It was awesome. I can eat some bacon, right? So here's the vision insight, though. It, what, what he says to, to Peter, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, the meaning of this vision is much more than snacking on some bacon, which I'm really thankful for, by the way. But it's much more than, that, than having a freedom to eat some pork chops, all right? God is saying it's time to change things up. It's time to reach the Gentiles. Anyone who is not a Jew, the time has come throughout the four corners of the earth for them to be reached. So it starts with a vision to initiate God's plan. Then it goes into an invitation to carry out God's 
plan. You'd see in verse 17 through 33. In essence, God is orchestrating this meeting between two polar opposite people. You have Peter, who's very Jewish, and you have Cornelius, who's very Gentile. And he's inviting them to meet up, and God is taking a risk with them. You see, that's who God is. He's a risk taker. He takes a risk with us, doesn't he? And he's invited us to this kind of relationship, this kind of friendship. He's saying, come on, I want you to take a risk. I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me. And he invites Cornelius here in verse 24 and says, Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So he gathers all his homies. He's like, come on, guys. We got to hear what Simon Peter has to say. He's got a message of life and it's time for us to hear it. So he gets everybody together. It reminds me of another story from Morocco when we got invited to a, a guy we met on the street. His name was Saeed. And he says, hey, will you come to my house? I'm a musician. I want to share some songs with you. I want to hear a little bit more about you. And we're like, okay. So there's about three of us guys. And we're like, let's go to his house. He's like, come over. You can have couscous and curdled buttermilk. Awesome. <laughs> so we're, we're there and we're eating our couscous. And I'm, I'm like taking one for the team because I have some of my buddy's buttermilk. He couldn't drink it. And so anyway, we're sitting around with him and he hears our story. He hears a little bit about Jesus and, and he shares some music with us. But the thing was, it wasn't just Saeed. It was all his buddies were there and his family was right there, all of them in this little living room. And we got to know him a bit and got more trusted friendship. And he says, hey, can you come back again next week? We're like, sure, let's do it. And so we go back again the next week and had a whole nother Moroccan meal and, and excited to hang out with him once again. He brings all his family and all his friends. And, and, and then the door opened up because he said, look, I had this dream that this glorious man appeared to me holding, holding this holy book. What does that mean? I'm like, well, I know what that means. Jesus is calling you. And he's like, really? And I was like, yes, he's calling you to everlasting life. And he wants to forgive you of all your sins. And he's like, really? I said, yes. Would you like to receive him? Explain, explain the gospel in full. And he's like, yes, I would. And I was like, are you sure? Because it's a big deal for a Muslim to, to put his faith in Jesus Christ. And, he, and he's like, yes. I said, are you sure? And he's, yes. Are you sure? You're positive. You really want it. Yes. And so he bows his head and receives Christ. The most beautiful part about this, he begins to strum his guitar and sing this worship song out of his heart to Jesus. And just praising God. Like seconds after he received Christ, he's like, just sings this song in Arabic. It's beautiful. But the best part about this, those friends he gathered around, his buddy was there and he's like, if Saeed follows Jesus, I will follow Jesus. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I'm sure. So he receives Christ right there. And then it's like the place is just, we're overwhelmed. Like, this is really happening. And then his brother speaks up and he says, if Saeed follows Jesus, I will follow Jesus. And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> yes. And he bowed his head and received Christ into his life. So the same kind of thing is happening here. Cornelius, he invites all his homies in. He's like, come on, you guys got to hear this message. And then Peter, he now finally gets it. He gets what this is all about. He gets why he had that vision in the first place. It says in verse 28 through 29, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So Peter is beginning to see God's master plan of evangelism which is found in 1 Timothy 2, verse three through four. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So Cornelius and his crew, they're eagerly away all that Peter has to say. Peter's now on board with God's plans. And, the, and Cornelius says here, now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So Peter's on the spot. He's like, okay, it's time to deliver this message of salvation to reveal God's plan. And Peter's message, it's just a simple gospel. We read it to open up our time together. It's just a simple gospel about Jesus who lived, he died, he rose again. But he starts out this sermon with, with stating in verse 34, God shows no partiality, Jew and Gentile alike. You see, all seven billion people in this world, God is longing to redeem. They are all in need of Jesus. 
red, yellow, black, and white, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor. We are all desperately in need of him. And he's preaching this peace through only Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 43, all the prophets testify, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. Come on. You see, Peter's initial fears, he was, he was afraid, like, what is going on, Lord? Why are you asking me to do this? What's this vision all about? And you want me to go to a Gentile's house? Oh, my, God. I don't know. But then before long, he began to see God's plan, and quickly his fear was turned into faith. You see, if we're willing to trust God in the midst of change, our fears will be turned to faith because the grace of God can change everything. God's pursuit changes our religious efforts to personal relationship. God's plan changes our temporary fears into radical faith. And finally, we see how God's power changes our mess into a miracle. Let's read verse 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. You see, what happens here is Peter's right in the, coming down to the end of his message, and then the Holy Spirit just goes boom and interrupts the entire situation. The Holy Spirit interrupts with an outpouring of power and of grace. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, on that, the Spirit of God would come in the same manner, interrupt us. So I need to ask, are we allowing the Holy Spirit to interrupt our plans, our agenda, our way? Are we allowing him to interrupt us a bit? So I want to share this bit of poetic thought with you to think of this idea of interruption. Interruption. I was in motion on this roller coaster, wondering, questioning, breathing my air, but a silent stare now catches my eye. Slow down for a second, I hear. Pause. Notice affection replacing fears. Quiet. Quiet. Invitation of life appears, say la, a holy interruption, love so fierce, from a miracle worker, transformer, changer of the messes made into beautiful faith. So I stop to say, interrupt my world any time you wish. Let me never miss the moments of you dismissing my weakness with your strength, my sins with your grace. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to interrupt our lives? It's gonna be for good. It's a good change. It's a lasting change. It's an, it's an eternal change. Now the best part of this interruption we see here in Acts, it was the Gentiles who heard the word and received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the Gentiles, uh, now it had been about eight years since the time of Pentecost. And there were Gentiles who put their faith in Jesus, but not without first conforming and converting to Judaism, fought now following ceremonial laws and eating kosher and those things. But this, what happens here is much different. It's much different. You see, the Gentiles could now come to God just as they are. And just as they were, regardless of pagan backgrounds, Roman customs, Greek and Latin cultures, etc., it didn't matter. God is just saying, come. Come on, just as you are. Just as you are. So too with us, God is calling us today, this very moment, to come to him just as we are. All he's asking for is repentance. That's all he asked for. Just come with a, a humble and contrite spirit, a, a, a heart that's willing to repent and turn to me, and I can change everything. 
And this would be a time that we, we can have our worship hosts come forward and begin to pass out the elements. Because when we hold that cup, when we hold that bread, it shows how God was the ultimate risk taker in pursuing relationship with us. That was one change that he did. His character stayed the same, but he made an eternal change and said, you know what? You guys in your own religious efforts aren't cutting it. You need my help. So he sends his son to die on a cross and shed his blood and his body to be broken for us so that we could live. He is a risk taker and he took that risk with us so that we could be changed into the image of his son. You see, so he says to us today, will you come to me with all your problems? Will you come to me with all your concerns, all your depression, all your anxiety, all your fears, all your weaknesses? Will you just come? Will you just come to me? Will you just come to me? I can change it. I can turn it around. He is the God of grace. He's good and he's loving and he's caring for us. And through the power of his spirit, he will transform the mess we have so woefully made into a walking miracle. So let's hold on to this for a second. And as you do, as you're thinking about this table of communion, this bread and this cup that God has shared with us, and this idea of change, and this idea of transformation, I think of this passage in Jeremiah where it shows a picture of the potter and the clay, that we can be trusted in the hands of our good and heavenly potter. It says in Jeremiah 18, one through six, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. Oh Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Let us trust the Lord for the change that he wants to do. It is good. It's for your growth. It's for your benefit. Are we, go, are we willing to trust that his pursuit is changing our religion into relationship? Are we trusting in his plan that is changing our fear into faith? And are we trusting that his power is changing our mess into an absolute miracle. So as we think upon this bread and we think upon this cup, we remember what Jesus did. All that he did for us to, to pave the way of salvation, to, to break down the door so we could have access to the Father. And maybe you're sitting here and it's been a while since you've been in church. It's been a while since you held a cup like this in your hand and you're like, I don't know. Come to him as you are. And in an act of faith, we partake and we say, yes, Lord, yes, I, re I will receive the grace that can change everything. Father, I thank you for sending your son. Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross on my behalf. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for raising Jesus from the dead. Lord, we trust you. We say yes and amen to the change that you want to bring to the transformation of life that only you can bring. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together. Now, if you could stand with me, I want to read a verse as a form of benediction. And we'll also have some people up front that you can pray with, whether it's receiving Jesus for the first time, whether it's getting a renewal of hearts and renewal of mind, come forward and get some prayer. Whether it's just that you're going through it and you need God to turn things around, ask for some prayer. Radical things can happen. I want to read this over you. It's from Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Jesus, thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room. Bless them abundantly. May they shine brightly your love and your truth throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday.